Good morning, good evening, depending where you are in the world, and welcome to this uh, second session, invited session for a wonderful speaker that we have today, Hao Li. Uh, so it's my great pleasure and honor to introduce Hao. Hao was a colleague of mine at USC, and we even wrote a few papers together. Uh, but the best way to introduce Hao is probably to read from what's on his website saying, I'm a German born punky of Taiwanese descent doing computer graphics. <laughs> uh, I'm also the CEO of Finscreen, a well funded startup that builds the most, the world's most advanced AI driven virtual avatars. Uh, as I said, he was an associate professor with tenure uh, in the computer science department at USC and the director of the vision and graphics lab at USC. Uh, he was a research lead at ILM, the Industrial Light and Magic. Uh, he spent a postdoc at Columbia and Princeton. He has worked with some of the leaders in the field, Ethan Greenspan, Simon Rusinevsky, and uh, Leo Gibas. So um, his work is truly outstanding. And the way we call it, the reason why I call it outstanding is because it's actually used in industry. Uh, his work on shape reconstruction and non rigid registration is in there. Uh, some of it is on the iPhone. Uh, so he has a slew of awards, uh, including the Google Faculty Research Award, the Okawa Research Foundation Award. Uh, he's considered one of the leading innovators in the world. Uh, he presented at places such as Davos, where he made a wonderful presentation. Uh, I'm not going to list all his awards because that would take all of his time. And instead, what I would like to do is have him in, have him present his work. So um, we are very privileged to have you, Hao, and I truly look forward to this session. Thank you. Thank you, Gerard, for the introduction. <clears throat> well, I guess I still have a really long way to uh, be as uh, recognized as you are. Um, so first of all, um, Happy New Year, everybody. Um, uh, thank you for uh, having me, uh, Gerard. Um, what I'd like to do today is um, give you a presentation about some of the uh, recent efforts that we have been working on uh, related to 3D avatars and also related to anything that has to do with virtual connectivity, right? We've <clears throat> developed something new that allows us to do volumetric teleportation in real time. And <clears throat> a lot of the focus of my research is on how to make them accessible to everyone, right? So uh, again, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Pinscreen. I'm full-time at my startup and also part-time a uh, distinguished fellow at uh, UC Berkeley um, since uh, November. Okay, so let me motivate a little bit this work. Um, the uh, world we're living in today is, you know, what you see here. It's like, you know, everyone is living in this unprecedented times. And uh, one thing that um, we see is that despite all the, you know, all the uh, divided uh, views of everyone, um, one thing is that everyone is, you know, living in this world where we're very physically distant, right? We're sort of like isolated and uh, people are lacking this connectivity that we had before. And um, one thing is that there's sort of like a surge or a need for bringing people together again. And the only tools that we have nowadays are, you know, things like, um, you know, uh, video conferencing, Zoom chats. I mean, this is the way we're presenting. I would love to be in uh, Hawaii right now. Um, and it's not just that, right? It's not just conferences. Entire life events are being shut down. And the same thing goes for the e-commerce industry. Right. So um, a lot of uh, retail stores are shutting down. And um, as a result, uh, a lot of e-commerce platforms are thinking about new ways where they can sort of like replace their the same type of experience you can have physically uh, in a virtual form. Right. And what you have nowadays are websites where you can do shopping. You have Amazon, uh, you have eBay, um, you have all kinds of websites, but you don't really have the same type of customer interactions you had in the past, right? And that's what, uh, these are sort of things that we're thinking about how we can uh, come up with new technologies um, to sort of um, enable these kind of capabilities. 
Another important motivation here is that when you talk about you know e-commerce, uh, is that you know eighty five of the customer interactions are going to be handled without human agents uh, by the end of this year. So let's have a look at some of the uh, technological trends that are happening and some things that are happening in the VR and AR space that can sort of um, give a form of replacement for uh, this type of problem. So first of all, uh, this is a great example I'd like to show. Um, this is a, you know, a work from Facebook Reality Labs um, where they're basically showcasing the ability to um, do remote interactions in real time uh, using photorealistic uh, avatars of a person, right? So this is their avatar codec um, work. And uh, the idea here is that they would basically record a person under different um, uh, facial expressions uh, using multiple cameras. So uh, multiple angles are being recorded and then they would encode you know, the space of expressions of a person uh, and then regenerate them online using an um, incomplete uh, capture, right? So basically you're wearing this VR headset and you have the ability to have your own representation, complete representation and being seen by another person, right? So this is um, sort of like a important step toward how we can interact remotely, but still feel like we're in the same space. But this is something that I guess is still going to take a couple of years until it becomes a product, uh, especially if uh, the construction of these type of avatars still requires, you know, Relatively sophisticated capture, pro uh, relatively sophisticated capture process, as well as you know, processing um, training that takes hours, etc. Now, um, it's not just interactions between humans that we need to innovate. Um, here's a work from a company in New Zealand called Soul Machine. So, <clears throat> they're basically building virtual assistants um, that, uh, in some ways, are adding, you know, a new kind of, um, uh, you know, a better interface to AI chatbots or voice assistant technologies like Siri and Alexa. So basically bringing this human-like interaction uh, back, right? So imagine if you um, need to talk to a doctor and you need to ask for, um, you know, you want to get a diagnosis or you want to uh, have a doctor do, do, do a quick checkup, you don't really have to go to the doctor. You can basically just go to a website and then talk to someone in a natural way, right? So there's a lot of case use cases where this is a lot more um, natural and also more efficient than responding to, you know, clicking through um, a window. Um, and, you know, I was mentioning a life industry being shut down um, and people are also innovating in that space, right? So here's a great example of a, maybe you've seen that, um, a rapper called Travis Scott, um, who is basically throwing a virtual event inside of Fortnite, right? So you have basically virtual concerts with a virtual avatar of a um, celebrity who is performing inside that virtual space. And one thing you can do here is basically reach out instead of thousands of people, you have millions of people, right? They can all watch the same person uh, giving a live performance online. So as we are experiencing or seeing how virtual um, celebrities of real people or even completely artificially designed humans are merging on uh, the internet, one of the questions here is how are they being created, right? So and if we look at how they're being created the traditional way in computer graphics, that's sort of things that we've already seen in, you know, movies, blockbuster movies, or even video, AAA video games, right? So in the movie industry, it's not uncommon that we want to have a digital actor. And some of the results that we've seen in movies like you know, Terminator Dark Fate, Fear 7, which I've worked on, is the results are you know pretty, pretty perfect, right? So you can get really, really good results. Um, but then the issue is that producing these um, digital humans still take a lot of effort. Right? So it's very it's a very costly process. It takes um, generally uh, you know months to basically just create a couple of minutes of animation or seconds of animation even. And um, <clears throat> but you can see that it's generally possible, right? If you put enough effort, if you um, put enough resources in capture devices in um, um, digital artists who would basically uh, craft all the digital assets. But one thing that people have shown uh, more recently is that it's also possible to have 
very realistic or very compelling virtual humans that can be driven in real time. Right? So this is very different because what you can do here is that you can like have a life performance driven puppeteering of a virtual character um, uh, and uh, basically uh, interact with another person, right? So here's a great demo from uh, Digital Domain where Doug Rubble is ba basically wearing this uh, motion capture suit with a um, head mounted uh, face tracker. And he's basically driving his own virtual avatar, right? So besides of, you know, the need for wearing these complex mocap suits and also, um, you know, the process of calibrating uh, his character, uh, one of the most tedious tasks here is actually to build the character itself, right? So the asset creation process is very tedious. So in this case, they actually um, came to our lab and uh, back at, IC, uh, at USC ICT. And uh, we actually scanned them using a uh, high-end um, <clears throat> 3D capture device, right? So one that was developed by Dr. Paul Dubevic. So here's an example of you know some of the celebrities that we've um, scanned at USC ICT. So one thing that you can see is that you generally need a you know controlled lighting capture environment. So the idea is basically to put a bunch of cameras around a person control lighting so that you have the ability to <clears throat> capture a high resu a fairly detailed um, 3D mesh of the person. Um, what you generally need are multiple facial expressions that you will then put together and create a animation ready rig, right? In addition to the geometry, one thing that you also need is basically the ability to um, capture the appearance of the person and in a way that it's um, can be relit under new lighting conditions, right? So in general, what you need at least is a uh, texture, albeit an albedo texture, uh, specular maps, or even normal maps, right? So these kind of things can be ca can be captured accurately if you have a way to control the lighting and then resolve for uh, these digital assets. Now, one thing that's kind of obvious is that um, it's not so easy to get a capture system like this at home, right? So if we wanted to build a technology that is for consumers to connect them with each other, right? Where I talked about virtual connectivity, about VR. Um, you can't, I mean, you can have really good results inside a research lab, but for everyday use, it, we can't really assume that we have these kind of capture equipment. So the question here is then what's the easiest way to digitize yourself, right? So obviously everyone has a phone and has a camera in their phone. So one of the things that we're building at Pinscreen is to think about how we can use AI to leverage um, data that have been pre-collected and then have the ability to infer something as close as possible to something that you would have captured using a high-end capture system. Now, the challenge here is the following. The challenge is that, well, first of all, you only have one view. Um, you can augment this with a couple of views or with video, but let's just assume with even with a single view at home, one of the hardest things is actually to know what is the right lighting condition to capture your face? You can't really assume that everyone would place lights perfectly uh, around them. If I wanted to digitize uh, someone else or myself from an older picture, then um, you know it wouldn't have been in an ideal lighting condition. So the main issue here is how do we handle unconstrained input data? So let me take a step back and uh, talk a little bit about um, AI synthesis in general. Um, the approach that we're going to take here is basically look at how we can um, use a deep learning based synthesis approach that has the ability to um, generate content in a way that I want it to be, right? In our case, I want it to be 3D and I also want it to be um, in some ways normalized, lighting normalized, expression normalized, post normalized. So before we get there, let's first have a look at what kind of, uh, you know, how AI synthesis has evolved over, over the years, right? So if you look at six years ago, um, so we have Ian Goodfellow, who's now at Apple, um, having this really pioneering work on generative adversarial networks. I'm pretty sure everyone uh, in this room has heard about that. And um, the th really interesting thing is that, you know, out of random numbers, you can really generate a very realistic face. And every year we get tremendous uh, progress in this area. And if you look at where we're at nowadays with StyleGAN2, 
you can see that you know we sort of have the ability to capture a very um, you know a, a very good space of variations of plausible humans, right? Humans that don't really exist but um, appear as humans, right? Now, the problem is this is two dimensional, and one of the new things that we've developed um, at Pinscreen um, is an approach that allows us to generate a three dimensional, um, uh, a three dimensional face of an avatar. And it's not just the three D part that's important. The other part that's important is basically that it has to be normalized. Now, if you look at the upper left image, this image is you know highly stylized. The lighting condition is you know very dramatic. And I mean, the face appears almost as purple and blue, right? Now, the question is, how do we know what kind of skin tone that person has, right? The traditional approach would be trying to, you know, normalize it in some ways, estimating, you know, spherical harmonics, et cetera. But I can guarantee you, if you use a traditional approach, you're not going to get uh, far. So the idea here is basically to take that input image and basically map this to a feature vector that sort of describe really the core likeness and the shape of the person and have the ability to generate a clean 3D model of the person. So what we do here is that even given this really bad input image or completely unconstrained input image, we can generate a normalized textured mesh of the person. There is no facial expression in there. They're basically neutralized. And we also show that we can actually insert them inside a new lighting environment, right? So this is an important step toward generating an avatar that can be used um, in uh, virtual environments. Now, how does it work? So <clears throat> first of all, uh, what is the challenge, right? So the challenge here is that as opposed to something like, I mean, ideally I would have hundreds of thousands of 3D scans uh, with perfect lighting and I can train something like StyleGAN2 just in 3D and generate the model. The only problem here is that there aren't so many models out there. Uh, for me to, there, there aren't so many training data. So I have to use limited training data. And uh, what happens is that with this limited training data, I can already get a coarse approximation of the person's face. Um, let me show you an example of Mark Benioff, right? So the first inference generates a face that kind of looks like Mark Benioff, right? It has the same skin tone. It has some facial hair that is similar. But to get the final likeness, what I do is I'm transferring this likeness from the original input image and do an iterative optimization using differentiable rendering and also using a loss based on perception. So this is very powerful. Uh, so even given you know really, really extremely different <coughs> looking uh, input images, I can get fairly consistent uh, output uh, textured meshes, right? So you can see here, sometimes he's wearing glasses, sometimes he's not. Uh, you have old pictures, etc., and the same thing goes for our facial expressions, right? So here's an example where uh, one of our co-authors basically recorded uh, different facial expressions, speaking, and you can see that every frame being reconstructed independently would generate a fairly consistent output. And now the same thing for lighting. So what you can see here, um, you can see we're using colored lighting condition and solving the face models per frame. And one thing you can see is that uh, it gives you a relatively consistent texture map despite the different colors. And in some of the frames, it's so, I mean, they're literally green, right? So it's hard to know, how do you know the, the, the actual skin tone of the person? So to solve this, we actually do a joint um, training uh, between the shape, the likeness, and the text, the skin tone of the person so that uh, we have the ability just from the shape to be able to identify what the skin tone is. So now if we compare this with what the state of the art is, uh, you can see that the state of the art can get you pretty good results, right? The, so the recent work from Lee, Lee et al. But then what's different is that in their case, they basically have the input, the textures from the input photo baked into the results. Right, so you, if you look at uh, the second column with uh, Beckham, you can see basically that specularities are basically baked into the textures. And also the facial expressions are baked in. So if you wanted to create 
a avatar that can be used, you have to normalize the output, right? And then there's always the question, do we get this, uh, uh, this output first and then normalize afterwards, or do we do it directly? So in our case, we're doing it uh, directly from the beginning. So let me just show you a couple of additional results. And uh, here you can see, even from a black and white photo, we can sort of like infer the right uh, skin tone, right? So this is a bit similar to these um, papers on coloring black and white images. Um, so it finds a correlation. Uh, here are a couple of other examples. You can see that the input photo have really completely different, you know, lighting uh, styles and colors, gradings, and it can still give you a fairly consistent type of output. All right, so let me move forward. Um, so these are basically static avatars. And obviously from this already, we could basically rig an avatar and make it uh, talk. But one thing that is really powerful is that if you basically add um, uh, an inference per facial expression, um, so if you did a neural um, rendering of the face, one thing you can, of the facial expression, you can do the following. So this is a work we've done uh, two years ago where we basically used uh, generative adversary networks to basically infer facial expressions that is conditioned on an input photo, right? So on the upper right, you have seen, you can see uh, single photos of a person. On the left, you have a person who's driving its facial expression. And from that one photo, you can basically generate that person's expression, right? And it's not just expressions, also views. Um, now, obviously what you can do with this are, uh, you know, applications where it can manipulate someone's identity. So uh, here's an example of a work that we've basically demonstrated at the World Ec Economic Forum in Davos uh, this year. So it's sort of like a more advanced version. Uh, instead of using a single photo, we're using a couple of minutes of recording of a person so that we can generate really, really convincing facial expressions that are personalized to the person and do a face swap, right? So here we're turning uh, Jiu into uh, Leonardo DiCaprio, uh, and we can also turn him into uh, Will Smith. And what it's also doing, it's also solving for you know lighting conditions of the environment, so it can do all that. So that's why you have this really consistent uh, color between the faces. So <clears throat> why do we care about this? Because um, the avatars that we create, right? So we have shown you how we create avatars but also how we do facial animation, right? So the idea of doing facial animation is not to just control the rig, but they have the ability from that rig to generate every pixel to infer a more realistic face. And if we increase this capability, here we can still see there's some blurriness around the face. If we increase this capability, we can actually get high resolution, you know, face swappings and, you know, um, there's a portmanteau for this uh, called deep fakes, right? Uh, as people would guess. And um, we have some projects actually where we're um, using these kind of techniques to train deep fake detectors. Um, but uh, just to show you how far we can go, we can actually increase the resolution. It's actually not so easy because uh, you need the GPU to have uh, enough memory to um, generate the fidelity. But let me show you a high resolution deep fake uh, of uh, Jair Bolsonaro. Let me show that. Boa noite. Dirijo-me a todos os cidadãos brasileiros para dizer que nunca houve injustiça tão grande quanto a prisão do presidente Lula. Que crime esse homem daí cometeu? Ele não tem triplex da praia. Ele não tem sítio. Right, so the scary part of this is that um, it becomes so good that under the naked eye, I think it's nearly impossible for me to see that there's a deep fake. And even for deep fake detectors, um, we have tried some state of the art ones and they also have uh, difficulties uh, detecting that this is a deep fake. Um, so the good news is we're not in the business of building deep fakes. Um, what our company does is we're using this type of neural face rendering to improve um, the to basically solve the uncanny valley problem of virtual assistants, right? So the question is, why don't we have more virtual assistants out there? One reason is that they all look like uh, video game characters, right? They don't look real enough. So what we're doing is we're using these kind of high fidelity 
your face renderings and integrate them inside a game engine so that we have the ability to um, generate photorealistic uh, faces. So let me show you a recent um, work that we've done. Uh, and we actually got the Epic Mega Grant uh, for this. Um, the um, uh, idea here is basically that you have an Unreal game engine and you have a character. And what we do is we train a um, neural face render of a specific person. And what we do is we integrate that inside the renderer so that while the person is being rendered or um, you know has some facial expressions, we can actually generate uh, its face in real time. So let me show you how this looks like. Hi, this is Digital Mick, kind of a successor to Meet Mike. This is me driving this digital character in UE4 thanks to a persona rig from Three Lateral that's reading my expressions, feeding into a Three Lateral facial rig inside UE4. I also have on an XN suit to get my body motion. And this is great, we love it. But as much fun as I am sitting here at the Motors Lab in Sydney, I can take this to the next level thanks to our friends at Hinscreen. This is and digital. <clears throat> the idea of using this and not to just have a playback is that we have the ability to build a system where we can integrate with a autonomous conversational AI in it, right? So the idea is that we can build a system where through voice input or video input, we can actually interact with a system that has a human-like interface, right? A little bit like something like Alexa or Siri, where you have a human interface uh, in between. So the idea is that you have voice, goes through voice recognition, and then you have a conversational AI system that we're also building ourselves. And uh, what we do is, in instead of just inferring just a text response, another thing that's important to infer is also what kind of gestures you want, what kind of uh, potentially emotions you want based on the context, right? So the NLP aspect and the graphics aspect have to work very closely together. We can generate the speech, we can generate uh, lip animations, gestures, and then this information is then fed into our you know, real-time rendering system that has neural face rendering. Uh, so you can see that there's a lot of um, AI components in here. And then you know, basically video stream to the user. So what I'd like to do is give you a quick demo of this. Um, some, uh, we have a system here. So um, the system here is, uh, let me just see if I can start it and use the um, interface. Maybe stop sharing. OK. And then let's see if that works. OK. So share screen. OK, so what you can see here, I hope it's loading. Yes. OK, so what you can see here, this is basically a simple web browser. So nothing is running on my computer. Um, the avatar is actually already running. It's actually on uh, AWS. Um, and uh, you can it's a little slow now through the, uh, through the streaming. Um, but the avatar is being streamed in real time from the server to my machine. And so this demo is, looks a little bit like Twitch, and I can talk to the avatar. Uh, it's fully unscripted. Um, I, I'll just see what she's, she'll respond. Sometimes it's great. Sometimes it's uh, really random. But uh, let's play a little bit around with it. Good night. How are you? I'm good. What are you up to? I'd love to chat with you. Oh, I'd like to chat with you, too. Um, I don't have so much time right now because I'm giving a presentation. That is cool. What kind of presentation are you taking? Um, I'm giving a talk on virtual avatars. That sounds interesting. I bet it will be really interesting. What do you think of Avatar? Um, I think they're the future. That's very cool. I'll bet you are right. It's going to be interesting. All right. I talk to you later. See you. Yes, I've been thinking about Avatar for a while now. I think it'll be really great. OK. Uh, all right. So let me get back to my presentation. Um, so you can see, right? So it's not really, um, it's not scripted at all. And um, you basically have a random conversation. So it's a little bit too 
um, GPT-2, uh, uh, but we actually enhanced some of the um, uh, conversations to have a little bit more uh, naturalness uh, to it. Okay, so that's basically, um, and then, <clears throat> so I talked about avatars that uh, can be controlled fully autonomously, right, so using a system, but there's another form of a uh, system that is, um, I think, also very relevant, which allows us to sort of stream, you know, a live performance from one place to another, right? So one way is to use a parametric 3D avatar model, right? Um, and um, to have that kind of uh, representation. So those kind of systems are good if you want to um, author them, you want to customize them, or if you want to um, have the ability to, um, you know, um, have a conversational AI in it. Another one is when you basically want to stream yourself, right? So just think of like, if I'm using a webcam, I'm streaming myself, but in 3D. And that's an idea that people have uh, been working on uh, for a couple of years, right? So if you think about, if you remember, uh, there was the system from Microsoft Research called Holoportation, right? So the idea is um, you have a bunch of um, sensors and 3D capture devices around this room and you basically get a real-time 3D scan of yourself and you can stream that content from one place to another. And if you wear an AR device, you can see the other person um, as if that person was in this, is in this room, right? And there's a bunch of other companies that are working on something similar. Uh, here's an example from Evercoast where they're putting Intel real sense sensors around the person and basically capturing his performance in real time. Now, this is great and really interesting for the industry, especially when it comes to 5G. Uh, but you can see, again, it's unlikely that people are going to have a room, a super sophisticated room with cameras around you to capture your performance. So one thing that we started to think about a couple of years ago at, you know, is basically, can we um, do the same thing from a single view? Because from a single view, that's the kind of system we have, right? So we have my laptop here with a camera. I have a phone that has a single camera. Can we do a full 360 capture of a person, including the clothing, from um, a single view, right? So that's a little hard to imagine because you have to see what's in the back of the person and what is the texture of it. But it turn out it's possible, right? So if you um, use the right training, uh, if you have the right training models and if you have uh, the right data representation, you can get actually fairly detailed models um, of a person, right? So what we've introduced was this new method called pixel line implicit function. Uh, it has two big ideas in there. The first thing is instead of inferring, you know, a voxel of, you know, uh, occupancy of a person inside, which usually gives you relatively low resolution models because of the memory limit, we're using implicit surfaces, right? So that's one thing that uh, gives you a better, more effective representation um, of the shape that is being learned. And then the second thing is basically enforce that um, the internal representation that you're using is in some ways aligned with the input image, right? So instead of having an input image being um, forced to map to one global feature vector, we're basically using one where the feature vector is present for you know, all the pixels in the input image and basically align the input and the internal representation. So in this way, uh, we've actually shown that it's possible to train a model using you know, hundreds, actually it's just, just hundreds of photogrammetry scans of people. Obviously we will augment them with additional lighting conditions, et cetera. But what we can do is given these input photos, we can generate a complete 3D model of a person, including the clothing, right? And you know, really nice things that you can see on the lower right uh, so if you look at that woman, um, there's even the bending of the knee that is being represented. So there's still a problem with this approach, uh, which is um, it takes around a minute to, um, you know, it takes around a minute to basically generate a single person, right? So it's a very um, compute intensive process and it's not really suitable for things like uh, real-time teleportation. So what we've been working on recently, that's something that we've shown, um, presented at ECCB last year and demonstrated at SIGGRAPH Real Time Life, is a system that can do this in real time, right? So the idea here is basically to use a 
hierarchical surface localization uh, algorithm for the sampling. So the sampling is uh, the bottleneck and combined with some very special implementation on scheduling uh, between the use of multiple GPUs that allows us to um, basically do everything in real time. So what you see here, so this is a uh, normal Logitech webcam. And on the right, uh, you basically have the 3D reconstruction of the performance of uh, Relong here, right? So uh, you can see you can handle clothing. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have a video where you have two people in it, but uh, to our surprise, it was also possible to have uh, two people in the same uh, space and even visualize the second person. Um, <clears throat> so here you can see another example where the uh, 3D reconstruction is being uh, is rotating in 3D, right? So you can see that uh, it's really capturing it. And we also have an example where we're streaming his performance live to a tablet device. So there's still a problem with this. Um, the uh, one of the issues is there's still limited resolution, and um, you know another problem is that uh, in order to render this in real time, uh, we only render uh, from the view that we care about, right? So it doesn't actually have the entire 3D model. So that's uh, something that we're looking into uh, the future. So uh, having multiple people, you know, use this is still something that uh, we need to. Um, explore how to do it. But nevertheless, um, this is an important step, uh, I think, toward a future that, you know, inspire uh, many of us, right? Uh, things that we've seen in Blade Runner 2049, where you have, um, you know, this sort of like a world where people have the ability to interact with another person. Uh, we don't have this type of hologram technology yet, um, but I think a key building block for teleporting someone from one place to another can be enabled using um, 3D deep learning, right? So a lot of things that you've seen in Star Wars, like how would how does the hologram of Leia, how would that even be possible if you don't have a capture on the person? Well, this is a um, demonstration that it's actually possible. So with that, uh, I would like to uh, conclude my talk and uh, thank you uh, so much for listening. So I'm uh, open for questions, uh, if there are any from the audience, thank you. Right. Well, thank you for a great talk, How, as usual. Uh, I think you have covered a, an enormous amount of material, uh, both in a tutorial manner and in uh, showing the, the stuff that you're doing. So uh, waiting for some question from the audience, let, let me ask you some question myself. I mean, you've touched on deep fakes. Um, can you expand on it? I mean, this is this is a, a, a real ethical issue that we're going to be facing, is it? What happens when we can no longer trust what we are looking at? It used to be that we understood we couldn't trust a picture because it was easy to manipulate a picture. But now we can't even trust a video, uh, not the audio and not the, the, the visual. Right. So right. can you, can you, and I know you talked about it at uh, Davos. Yeah. So, the can entire talk was about that. <laughs> exactly. So, can you can you give us a, a sense of the uh, the issues and also the the potential solution that you that you are envisioning mm -hmm. there? Yeah. So, first of all, it is an actual issue, um, and uh, I don't think the issue is getting smaller; it's actually getting bigger. The good news is that it hasn't been so damaging nowadays. I think there a few reasons for that. One of them is because you don't really need sophisticated things to spread fake fake information, as we're witnessing every day. Um, the uh, bad news is that it has been used, I mean, it is being used uh, actively in things like pornography, um, where celebrities are inserted into uh, porn um, and uh, it has been used to harass uh, women. Um, so it, it is something that has been used um, uh, for the spread of disinformation, also for harassment. So it is a problem. And another reason why this is um, a still a concern that we should be aware of is that you know the quality is getting better and better. Um, there's going to be new capabilities. I mean, if you look at what's uh, possible with uh, you know what OpenAI is showing with GPT-3, you can generate the con. You basically have the YouTube of uh, you know, 
uh, the, the YouTube for content, right? So instead of like searching for something, you can generate the content that you want. So that's sort of like where things are developing. I think that becomes kind of scary. On the other hand, um, what can we do against it, right? And I think we are doing a pretty good job in at least raising the awareness that this is possible. And I think, I mean, the media has talked, you know, um, quite a lot about, you know, the dangers of deep fakes and this and that. And I think people understand um, uh, this, this concept, right? And um, I think the good thing about deep fakes is that they have made people think about maybe that I cannot trust everything that I'm seeing. And I think that's um, the first thing, right? That's sort of like, um, a vaccine for inf disinformation. The second thing is there are efforts, and we're actually part of a um, uh, of the DARPA Semaphore program uh, in uh, developing new tools for the spread of disinformation or for analyzing um, potential disinformation threats. Uh, so there are um, federal uh, efforts in you know doing research and how. Uh, these kind of content can be analyzed uh, better. It's very different than what was done before in a sense that what they're looking at right now is more trying to use context, multimodal aspects of um, uh, of uh, the media to analyze if something is fabricated or not. And of course, the last point is basically uh, from a legal standpoint, um, if there are you know laws that are being made in terms of uh, banning uh, the use or the use of defakes or any AI manipulations for um, malicious purpose, um, you know, if that, you know, that can be punished. So then, and, and there are lawmakers that are working on that. So uh, in that sense, there are some efforts that are being done. So, um, so these are sort of like the three main areas I would see how we can protect ourselves. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you know, government regulation only work when government, for the government that that applies it. So, you know, there are a number of government for, or no places where government is weak enough that uh, there is no enforcement. So, uh, you know, there is a limitation to what you can do. With, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, there's government, but there's also, I think, Governments are one thing. I think the most dangerous place is actually on social media. And I think social media did a, I would say, a pretty good job. At, I think the tech companies of, um, you know, not, not just censoring, but even flagging certain content as uh, being, you know, this is, uh, you know, disinformation or this fact has not been verified. Um I mean, people are saying that they're not doing enough, but I think I found it quite interesting that uh, when, as researchers, we are, you know, we discuss these problems, and then in a week later, the the, the tech companies already implemented it. Okay, we do have a question from the audience from Terry Bolt. Uh, first of all, he said it's a very nice talk. I, I, I agree. You mentioned many other efforts, but you didn't mention Neon. Can you say a bit about you about your view about the neon avatar from Star Labs uh, Samsung? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Yeah, maybe maybe I'll uh, <laughs> I, I can include them in my next uh, presentation. So um, neon. So I think uh, neon is uh, so what neon is. Uh, so neon avatars are basically um, virtual. They're also like virtual avatars that are connected to some form of conversational AI, and uh, the purpose is very similar to what we build at Pin Screen. Um, I there, there isn't much public information on the technical side on how they do certain things. Uh, but from what I can tell, I, I would guess the following. I would guess that, um, I mean, um, we've seen some of the demos at CES last year uh, before the pandemic. And um, I mean, you can see s certain things, right? So I, I don't want to speak for them or say anything wrong. But I would say they have some techniques for um, 2D um face manipulations um i think the content is i mean the content must be 2d uh whereas what we're doing is actually 3d so i would say these are two different things uh what is the advantage of having 3d if what you see is 2d anyway well one thing is you can have full control over gestures and customization um of the person 
now you might say that, wow, you know, you can use everybody that's now and you can do the same thing. But then you have to think about how content is being created and uh, would you basically be limited to only these few characters and have the whole process of creating them or can you uh, create them, you, you can, or can you create anything that you want uh, using um, a creative team? So um, there are pros and cons of using each of them. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's, I, I would say on a technical level, just think of Neon being 2D and our stuff is 3D. Okay, thank you. I have a, you know, I have a question for you since you, you were at uh, you were at the USCICT and uh, building virtual humans has been a 20 years effort, uh, you know, and, and we're not there, we're not there. So uh, the difficult question, you know, is, is it gonna be there in two years, in five years, in 10 years? It's a hard question because it's always easier to look back and say, okay, this is why it happened as opposed to trying to predict. So are you willing to kind of give a, 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 a bet as to when we will have this photorealistic avatar that is able to move and and have the facial expression and the body expression and the oral expression so that it is accepted? I, I love predictions. <laughs> yeah. right. So. I would say if we put sufficient efforts uh, and we have enough resources, it's possible uh, to get something really good in uh, a year max two. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if you, yeah, I think the tools are there. Um, I think, I think the technology is there to, I mean, um, uh, yeah, I, the the tools are definitely there already, and I I mean we're pretty I mean the uh, advancements that we have made actually in the past six months are also incredible, and the reason why I give uh, such a I'm not it's definitely not in five years is because of all the advancements in um, GANs and uh, that are making this possible and um, yeah. Thanks. We do have a question from uh, Stefan Leonard. Is it possible to obtain a high resolution 3D avatar slash hologram using advanced equipment like it's shown in your lab, then control the generated avatar using lower quality equipment, for example, a cell phone camera? Right. Um, I mean, that's, yeah, I mean, you can. So there's no reason why this is not possible. Uh, let me see if there's a good example for well um, so the problem with so okay so the difficulty with using a low quality equipment like cell phone camera is where do you the question is where do you render the avatar so <clears throat> um, you can you can of course uh, control it and but then the question is how good the quality is and the reason why, we have, I mean, it's not a bad question because um, the problem is the stuff I was showing before is cloud rendered. And on the cloud, we have a good GPU that can do the neural face rendering. And <clears throat> the GPUs on the phones are still very limited for uh, these kind of renderings. Uh, I would think they're, they're, they're going to be uh, possible when they have better chips because you're going to have better, um, you know, deep learning processors or processing capabilities on phones. But I mean, at the moment, not so much, I would say. Um, the So a good way to see how far we can go is look at where, tri I mean, if you just think about computer graphics, where AAA games are, right? Or at least on mobile phones. So think about like, I don't know, Call of Duty, or I mean, they've spent a lot of money to optimize the graphics rendering. So probably that's almost the best you can get. But then if you want to use uh, anything that is uh, using these neural face renderings, uh, you can see that uh, phones still have limitations. And you know, one example is um, when you look at these things that social media companies like Snapchat or uh, TikTok are building, they have these uh, gender swapping effects, for example. I mean, they, I'm, I mean, if you run this on a PC, you'll have really good quality. 
but on the phone you're kind of limited right to what's possible still um but it's it's uh quite impressive what's possible already so yeah Oh, you're, I cannot hear you, Jean. Yes. So uh, I think we have uh, reached the, the end of the session. I, I just want to thank you again. This was a wonderful uh, presentation and a blend of graphics and vision because, you know, what we have to do here is not just produce a thing. We have to also process the input, which is what we do in this computer vision field. Right. Right. Uh, so, and you've closed the loop between this processing and then the rendering, and I, it, it produces a very exciting future. Uh, I think you have, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're living in this area, uh, both computer vision, computer graphics, which is advancing at, the, at an amazing rate, uh, and uh, it's going to make a future very different from uh, what we knew. Um, so, uh, and, really is that, and with you, with you giving yeah. giving the one year one year horizon for something amazing, uh, is uh, makes it even more exciting. So, um, uh, any concluding remarks before before we close? Yeah, I think what's really exciting is that um, I mean, it's closing the loop, but it's you can see there's so many possibilities now, right? So if you look at how NLP is advancing, and there's so many things that we haven't explored yet. So I think it's just the beginning of something that's, you know, a lot more research that we're, I'm, I'm really excited about. Excellent. Well, yeah. thank you very much. And again, I I represent the audience in applauding. Great seeing you. <laughs> same here, same here. And hopefully we can right. see each other real next year in Hawaii. Oh, my God. That would be great. Let's All do right. it. All right. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Everyone, bye. thank you. Thank you.